So we're going to be doing, we're going to be looking at in and RMD as we go through this. Because I, I should probably just save them before I uh, too late for that. Uh, this is also good practice and uh, timing. Like I started the presentation about two hours ago. I was like, oh, I should probably put this together now. Uh, if you can do sliced in two hours, you can do a presentation in two hours. That's just, that just makes sense. Yeah, like I saved like the last 30 minutes or so, like where <laughs> I was just knitting and like kind of going back and forth that, oh, it's weird, or I should explain this. It was, it was very sliced-esque, I'll say. Just want to feel the pressure again. Yeah, I know. I needed something. <laughs> um, part of that was for another reason, but we'll get to that. Uh, I don't know if you guys read this ahead of time. or I, I know me, personally, at this point, I usually just like let the, let the presenter talk. And I'll, um, if I'm interested in details, I'll go and read it afterwards. But obviously, as a presenter, I actually have to read it ahead of time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I read it. Very, very guilty of doing that. I actually like barely count myself as being in the club, but sometimes I turn. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'll just share my screen. I, I, so the the chapter they have like something. Actually, a lot of it covers prediction intervals, but like they don't really highlight that. But then I realized that like last minute, and I was like, oh, I should switch from confidence intervals to prediction intervals. It turns out it's kind of hard to do that for like binary classification. Like there's not built in packages for that, uh, which is why I realized that they use uh, Stan for their model in the package or model in this chapter because you can get prediction intervals from it. I was like, well, I should have thought of that earlier. I'd love to see a list of which parse that models have. Confidence in or prediction intervals. Yeah, I would love to. Uh, I, I, I don't many. think it's really any of them. It's like you no. have to do something with the standard. Oh. Um, maybe LM, but like stuff with binary classification, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll just share the right hand screen. Uh, actually, if I share my entire screen, I only have one monitor right now. If I share my entire screen, it won't, I guess it won't show. Uh, like the Zoom stuff. Let's see, new share screen. Yeah, it should work. So I just want to have both open so I could show the, like the raster stuff. Um, okay, so it doesn't look like we have a ton of people here, but that's okay. You get it, it's just us. You don't have to. I don't have to explain as much because I partially. I think I understand stand this chapter. I get the big ideas. Yeah. Um, but like, I wish I could have done something more creative with the presentation. In the end, it's just kind of the kind of like a rehash of some of the most of the ideas covered in chapter. But anyway, it's, it's all good. I didn't read it, so you can teach me. <laughs> I think, especially with with three of us here, I, I don't want you to spend more than two hours on, on a presentation. That's that's kind of silly. It takes fifteen minutes to read. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was good for me. Like that, yeah. some practice. So I, I don't. I'm not saying that was a waste of time at all. Like, yeah, also I get the high from uh, doing it in two hours. Right? Trying to knit at the last yeah. minute again. Like, I think yeah, I did two hours is perfect. <laughs> uh, actually, while we're here, let's yeah, let's go through some of the memes I made for this because yes. in the this is the most important part. Yeah. So while I realized that I should be doing. Uh, prediction intervals instead of confidence intervals. Oh, you can tell this is a new computer. <laughs> uh, I was like, oh, I should probably do something. <laughs> I saw this. I actually, this, I didn't create this one. I saw this one online. That's good. Uh, so then this one I did make up. So, so the chapter, yeah, <laughs> prediction interval. Like, oh, yeah, it's a confidence interval. But if you know mathematically, there, there is a difference. Yeah. Uh, and then... Yeah, it's, something, it's related to, so this is actually from the chapter. Many models yeah. can calculate this. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So anyways, that, that was what I did instead of trying to figure out how to do prediction intervals with the binomial classification. Uh, OK, so critical results. If you're like me and you're pretty new to all this stuff, you're going to ask yourself what the heck that is. 
And it's basically just like this band that we put around, like, I guess maybe the easiest way to think about it is like, you have two features, you get this 2D plot and like you can perfectly separate uh, your yes and no classes uh, and your binary classification setting. Um, it's, uh, we, we can think about like uh, basically the uncertainty around that, that, uh, that line that slices between uh, our yes and no uh, groups. And I honestly, like, I should just go back to the chapter for this because they have a better example uh, than I do. All right. So like this where they created some fake data um, and you see like probability of class one or, or the other class uh, shown with the orange and purple. Uh, and like the white, the white band there is kind of like the uncertainty around that. Um, so if you, you could uh, make that smaller or larger uh, given your some like how confident you wanna be uh, in, in your prediction. So say I wanna be really confident in it so I want that you want that band to be larger in that case, because like uh, you don't want anything to be in that white area. Like that, that, that might be like uncertain in any way. So it's a equivocal zones is like is a way of kind of uh, quantifying that, I guess, or making that like statistical, like saying, oh, I want to actually be more confident in my results. Well, to actually do that, at least for the binary classification setting, kind of increase the width around. Um, your like uh, your cutoff range. So in, in the case, maybe the most common case, you have like prediction, yes or no, and like 0.5 is like what the, the threshold of uh, where if you you know have a probability, if you're above 0.5, you're gonna predict one class and if you're below it, you're below, uh, then you'll predict the other class. Um, so we can create like a band around that saying like, oh, look, I. I don't want to be uncertain about this at all. So I want things to be greater than 0.7 or greater than 0.3. I want to create a band of 0.2 around that 0.5 center. Uh, so you want it to, you, in order to actually make a decision on your prediction, you want that band to be wider, at least you, in the case that you want to be more confident. If you don't care about confidence at all, you can just have that 0.5 and like no, don't even look at any like, like, a, like a band around that. Uh, which is kind of like the common case, uh, right? Like what we typically do is like, oh yeah, let's. I just care about what the model tells me. Is it a one, one or zero? Um, and then you, maybe you look at like, you know, the, the prediction interval. Well, actually in a lot of cases, it's actually the confidence interval. Maybe you look at that to say, oh, you know, if it's smaller, that's great. If it's not, well, I just wanted a one or zero anyways. <laughs> at least that's often my perspective on things. Um, so I didn't use their data set in the chapter which they use as like a simulated data set to illustrate this concept. Of course, me being a software per person, I went to 538 and uh, pulled their software data, I guess, match level data, uh, where they have like a bunch of features. Uh, you'll see here, I just kind of pulled out uh, SPI, there's software power index. Uh, probably like they have a probability of each team winning. So uh, this is actually a pregame probability and then an importance from zero to 100. Uh, so I guess if this is like the, the end of the season, the end of the Premier League season, and you got like the top two teams in the table and they happen to be playing, uh, you know, the importance is going to be uh, closer to 100 uh, for both of them. Uh, so I think, you know, that's actually like, it's a pretty big confounding factor often when you're like looking at matches, uh, especially like with soccer, right? Where uh, some team might have already been relegated or like is out of the top six in the league already, like with the last two games to play. So they're like not even playing people or in the NBA where, where players like uh, get rested because their team's tanking. I guess with football, maybe it's not as, I mean, I, I guess people in football, right? If your team's out of it, maybe like the coach is like, oh yeah, let's uh, let's put this guy in the injury list and he doesn't play. Um, but yeah, the importance uh, number there, is, I think is a, it's pretty key for a lot of things uh, for, for predictions. So we're actually going to use that, spoiler alert. Uh, I, just, uh, I, I go down here and create a quick GLM model with the SPI, so the power index of the first team that they have listed and the importance for the first team that, that they have listed. So I guess I didn't make a printout of the data frame, but it's like they have the home team and the away team listed as uh, team one and team two. And then they have uh, SPI one, SPI two, prob 
one, prob two, and importance one and two. Um, so all like uh, good numeric features for like predicting uh, match outcomes. I do uh, I do split here. So they actually have a lot of data on the 2021 season, um, and then like less data on their uh, on older seasons. So I do something kind of opposite here, where I make the older data the test set, <laughs> which I think is okay because it's not like I mean from season to season, like, there's like a ton of team changes. So I'm not as worried about data leakage there. Uh, right, and we see like there's a pretty even split here, and we don't necessarily expect these to to be like 50-50 splits because there are a lot of draws in software. And so when I created this W1 uh, variable, this is literally did the home team win. Um, and if they draw or lose, then uh, then that value is zero. So I think even at the home team, there is some home field advantage in software. Um, there's also just a common occurrence of draws. So uh, we actually see the majority of case uh, the home team not winning, but that's because there's a lot of draws. Uh, there is some kind of interesting difference in balance between the test and train set, where uh, the no and yes classes are closer to 50-50 in the test set. Uh, you know, that's probably something if, if I really cared about this, I would adjust for, like, try to account for, but uh, just something about. So, yeah, and I, I create a model with just two features because it's easy to plot out. Uh, notably, like, there's a large intercept term here. Uh, meaning, I, I don't know, like, what the typical inference is on that, like, oh, it means, like, the other two factors, like, don't really add much. Both of these, SPI1 and importance, are on a scale from 0 to 100. So it's, like, you know, a 1%, uh, maybe, like, a 10% increase in SPI or a 10-point increase in SPI, you know, increases the odds, uh, the log odds by, like, 0.1. Um, it doesn't seem like a lot, but maybe I have a hard time like conceptualizing some of this. Uh, anyways, I think it's you know sort of interesting. I always, I don't know, my a bell goes off in my head anytime I see like intercept uh, with a, like a much larger value than the other two terms. I don't know. Often that tells me like the other two are like not providing all that much information. Um, but you know, this is all for example. Anyways. <laughs> Uh, the, the scale of the variable, right? Too like is is SPI one. If it's in the thousands, then you need to you need a large negative intercept, right? To to cancel out. Okay, well the you know the average SPI is eight hundred. So once you get that, you've already got a I don't know six percent win or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So these are both on zero to hundred. Oh, it's both is, on zero to hundred. Yeah, which is fairly large. And we'll, we'll actually get later to a model that is actually just based off pregame probabilities, which is a little easier for me to conceptualize. But I think you're right. I, I think maybe it's kind of a, I shouldn't be that worried about it. Uh, uh, yeah, oh, well, I guess I can look at the model accuracy just based off those two uh, features. Get a near 50% accuracy on the, uh, the test set. Now, if you're like a betting man, Maybe you care more about you know false positives or true negatives or something like that, uh, but in our case, we're just looking at accuracy. Uh, so this would be a nice plot with like a nice raster background to show, which I've never actually done one of these before, where you show like the actuals as like like here blue and red here, uh, actual yes and actual no did team one win, but also like a shades of probability in the background. So I think I have it here. Um, so we should expect that team one, when their SPI is higher, they're a stronger team. I mean, well, I guess we don't necessarily know the other team's SPI, uh, but we can assume that you know, higher team one SPI means a better team. Uh, so as you know, their strength increases, generally the model is more likely to predict that they'll win. Uh, but also like as importance of the match to team one, increases, like there's actually, you know, this like inverse relationship, which I don't know if I quite get. <laughs> Maybe there's like a lot of confounding factors for not uh, really seeing. Oh, oh, wait, wait, no, no, I'm, I'm misunderstanding it. Yeah, the higher um, the importance of the matches to T1, then yeah, the more likely they are to win. Given like, let's say like, you know, T1's SPI is like 50, you know, on the lower, if the importance of the match is zero, 
the model showing that the probability of team one winning is is less likely versus you know if the importance is higher they're more likely to win. okay so i was just reading that uh you can definitely tell i put this together in like an hour <laughs> That looks good. That's a cool raster plot. And I think you, you got the interpretation there at the yeah. end. Yeah. Yeah. Like, sense. I've never like actually plotted something like that. Now I'm thinking like, am I, <laughs> did I go wrong? I, I should be doing stuff like that. Uh, actually, I think this was their version of that. Uh, so this is the part where we actually get to use one of the two packages they introduced in this chapter. Uh, this one being probably. So this, this is what we use to create that equivocal zone like that buffer around our 50% uh, cutoff between yes and no classes. Uh, so in our case, I'm setting a buffer uh, like 2.5%. Uh, yeah, 2.5%. And we see like it creates like this special output whenever you do like a, even a deployer count. So it's like actually tidyverse aware where it knows to assign, to keep the class of that column, this new column we've created, um, which I think as they described it, it's just like if a factor column or a character column, it has all the same properties. Um, but I think, yeah, where it extends some of those uh, for other use cases of make two cloud spread, uh, which if you actually go read like the probably documentation, they show like an interesting use case of optimizing your binary cutoff. So instead of having it be 0.5, they kind of like use this make two class uh, pred function to figure out what's like the optimal uh, cutoff value. Uh, so they don't, they don't cover it in this chapter. And uh, if I cared more, I would have <laughs> I would have actually like included it because I think it's like a really interesting use case. But I think that's why they have like these extra properties uh, with, uh, uh, with a, a column created with this function. Do you think of it as a hyperparameter is it something you could like tune with dials or something? Yeah, I think um, I think what was it in chapter seven or some earlier chapter in this book? They explained their philosophy on it, like like it is sort of a hyperparameter, but you don't tune it necessarily in the same way because it's based off like knowing the actual values. Uh, so it's like that's why they feel like it has to be separated out and it's not something included in tune. Uh, but yeah, I know, you know, from a practical sense of uh, point of view, I think explaining it like that is like a pretty good way. Like, yeah, it's something meta about the model, right? That you have to figure out the value for. So, I mean, I, I'm okay with that, explaining it like that. Um, one thing I found interesting is like doing the simple confusion matrix looks very different. Uh, so this is like the normal confusion matrix where you got a lot of like uh, true negatives top left and that's the majority case. Uh, but if you if you exclude uh, the non-reportable results, then you get like most uh, being as like false uh, positives. So where you predict yes and the truth is no. Um, I'm not smart enough to like understand like, or I had to think about like how you would use that information to adjust your model. But that is that is pretty interesting, right? I guess it's more likely to be to predict false positives. So perhaps I guess that's where you go the extra mile and figure out, okay, maybe 0.5 is in our, our optimal value because it's coming off with a lot of uh, false positives. So uh, you would have to do some work to find a better uh, threshold value. Uh, so they have a plot like this in the chapter where they showed uh, as accuracy decreased, uh, reportability increased, or what was it? Yeah. So yeah, actually, as accuracy, yeah, as accuracy increased, going to the right, the red line, uh, reportability increase, uh, decreased. So that makes sense, right? The, if we uh, if we're only choosing the points that uh, are the, on the most extreme edges of our probability range between zero and one, the ones that we're most confident in, we're likely to get more accurate results. But that also means we're just using less of our data. So I think that's what they're showing here. Uh, with mine, it had like this kind of interesting relationship, which I think more tells me that the model sucks than, than anything. But uh, you know, it's, I, don't, I like the idea of doing like a sensitivity analysis on this, right? Like, uh, I think it's the same idea behind what they, the, like the whole probability, uh, probability package where 
we test out different cutoff ranges and see what works for, for you. Is this saying that your model is this saying that your model is not gaining any accuracy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it, as it loses reportability, it doesn't gain any accuracy. Is that what is that? Is it's that like losing it? accuracy as you try to find the, as you try to just pinpoint the most extreme, most confident points. So it like really sucks on the edges, which is like very counterintuitive. So I don't know. Like that's why that early accuracy number I came up with, like 57%. Well, it seems like okay. Like I'm doing better than flipping a coin, but predicting yes or no, is the team going to win? It's I, it feels like it's me misleading. And that's I think that's what this is telling me, right? Like your model thinks these are the most uh, these are the observations it's most confident in. But when you like really zone in on that, your actually your accuracy actually uh, decreases. But at the same time, I'm wondering if I'm like misreading it. Like, I don't know why the initial value of accuracy is like 0. Uh, 0.43. Maybe, uh, maybe I had to like flip the levels. Yeah. That's I think what I was thinking. This happens yeah. to me all the time. Whenever I do this auto plot, it's, it's like backwards. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Good catch. Okay. Yeah. As I was like, trying to justify why this plot looks the way it is, we realized that that, uh, that explanation was wrong. Is this the zero one thing again, Joe? Is that, is that what we're looking at? Yeah, it's a zero one thing, but it's also like just the auto plot for for these like accuracy metrics. This is not the first time I've come across this. Yeah. Okay. So that's a that's a good catch. But yeah, I don't know. I, I should have caught that while making this. Uh, but uh, yeah. So in that case, if I flipped it, it would show the same relationship that we saw in the chapter. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes me feel a little bit better. I was like trying <laughs> to justify why I just like what I did. Um, again, another one of these plots that I'll, I'll need to uh, pull up. So this one is similar to that last raster plot, but this time we're plotting uh, standard error. Um, with the fill, so with red. So we see what we should expect to see, I think, where on the boundaries of things, we have higher standard error, right? Like in our more extreme cases, like team SPI is 100 all the way to the right. And it doesn't even matter what the importance of the match to team one is. Like that's just such an extreme case. This model is not really doing great with like predicting on that. So I think that's what that meant. that's meant to show. That's a really cool plot. I want to make that plot for something that I've made just to, just to see what it looks Wait, like. Is this is this is team S, team one SPI? I may, I, I may have totally missed this. But is team one SPI the net difference between team one and team two, or is it just how good is team one? In it's how good is team one? The latter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. If I were doing this like as an actual model, I'd just include all the features. But yeah, sure. Uh, okay. Model applicability applicability which i think shows as like oh no they don't uh i thought for a second it was going to show me like that's like an unknown word it is not a common word that i use but also neither is equivocal results so i'm learning all kinds of new buzzwords i can use in data science life um okay so here's a new model and i probably should have just done this model to begin with because i feel like it's a little maybe more intuitive where the only two features we're using is the pregame probability that team one wins and the pregame probability of a draw. And I guess where this can get confusing is like once we make the prediction, your prediction, you can get probability. So you could, your model is probability based off these other probabilities. Uh, who knows, maybe one or the other is more confusing. Um, so yeah, I think uh, seeing the scale of this coefficient, right? Like, okay, probability if the team one probability, pre-match probability of winning, uh, as that increases and your log odds of team one winning increases. Um, I guess the pr probability of tying, that's kind of an interesting, I don't really have like a direct interpretation of that. Um, I would guess that probably having an interaction term here would make this like easier to interpret. Cause like, what does that really mean? It's like the probability of a draw increases and somehow probability of team one winning increases. I don't know. Um, so we do kind of the same process. Uh, this turns out to actually be like more accurate, which maybe, yeah, again, maybe I should have just done this to begin with. Um, 
Yeah, so now, now I want to do similar plots to what we did with the purple green, the folk uh, theme, um, where we look at all like a grid of like combinations of possible pre match probabilities of team eliminating plus pre match probability of draws. And right, like both of those can't be above 0.5, or the sum of those can't be above one. So that's why this is the way it looks. Uh, my thought here, uh, and like they use a, in the book, they use a great example of like COVID, right? Like uh, how that changes like cycling patterns, uh, the frequency of cycling patterns, which I didn't want to do just because I wanted it to be different. But like my interpretation of like where the most extreme cases here is like when you have like a pre match probability of a draw being above like 30%. <laughs> uh, like I think in most cases, it's, it's usually below that, even though, you know, draws exist, right? But like a lot of times, I don't think their model predicts probability of job being greater than 30 or 40 percent. So your more extreme cases are going to be kind of uh, to the right here. Uh, but I, I think in even like the most extreme case probably here is like the predicted probability of a draw being 50 percent and the predicted probability of team one winning being 50 percent. Like in, what, in which case like yeah team one's like you know not predicted to win and like there's also like or team two is not predicted to win at all and like there's an even split between the team one winning and a draw. Uh, or anything really on this uh, upper boundary, right? Like anything where the draw is 100% and team one's <laughs> expect, not expected uh, to win at all, uh, which also implies team two is not expected to win at all. But like, shouldn't we see like more uncertain um, uncertainty up there? So that's a, I guess that's um, I guess what I was trying to point out here is like this model is really not capturing a, like as much information as it should, at least for if we wanted it to be useful, right? Like it should show like a lot more uncertainty on these these edges here. Um, uh, so yeah, we move on. So they go through this whole like discussion, which is pretty new to me, about how to identify uh, like observations in your train set that are maybe like influencing your model a lot. Which I guess maybe if you think back to basic model fitting, um, you think about like outliers or whatever, how you determine that from maybe like regression, you could use like Cook's distance to uh, determine outliers. But I guess maybe this approach, um, they, I think they, they're speaking in like broader terms here. Like uh, given like our model and the data set we trained it on, like in this case, we trained it on 2021 data. Like how can, is it valid to apply that to like another year's data? In most cases, uh, it is going to be like that, but obviously with like COVID related data or like something majorly impacted by COVID, that's not gonna be, uh, 2020 is gonna throw off your models a lot. Uh, in, our, in our case, like I don't think we have anything that like fundamentally changes, um, you know, or like is different between pre 2021 soccer data and and 2021 soccer data. Now, if we had like some like huge rule change where they started awarding three points for draws and two points for wins or something, then you, you would definitely see like a change or there, there'd be there'd be a case where the test set, uh, like say your test set is like 2025 and we're making this rule change where draws are three points and wins are two points. Um, if you had that as your test set, you know, your model is not gonna be, doesn't really apply to that test set. Right? Like there's some fundamental difference uh, that's changing the nature of, of the data in your test set. Uh, so I think that's the point that they're getting to. Um, and uh, yeah, so they use PCA for that, uh, mainly looking at these distance scores. So they compute distance based off the components from PCA, and then they basically take uh, those distances and create like uh, an ECDF. Uh, type thing versus yeah, they take the absolute value of like your components and like plot that uh, outside the distance. Or uh, actually, am I interpreting this correctly? So they take like, your outliers are going to be all the way to the right here, higher distance, like away from the centers of your components, your PCA components, uh, and like right, your higher percentiles correspond with those those higher distances. Uh, so I think I was trying to illustrate that here, like with this red line, 
it's fairly far away from zero. So zero being like right at the component centers, uh, like right at that zero, zero point in this left side graph. Um, you see the blue uh, extends out a little bit, so, but it's like not that much, not as much as the red one. Um, so it's distance you can imagine is like less than one, uh, at least on this scale. Uh, and I've normalized the variables beforehand. So I don't know, I guess we can think of these in terms of like normalized, yeah, norm, normal variables. Um, and then this red line is, is like represents an observation, a single observation from, I believe this is from the test set, kind of in the train set though. Uh, but yeah, it represents a single observation um, mapped into this lower dimensionality space. Uh, its distance is above two, which, you know, not that high, but if you look at it relative to everything else, that's probably puts it around like the 80th percentile. So like amongst the higher uh, end of things. Uh, so yeah, if we were to come and like plot those distances, it would probably be, you know, up here um, uh, on the graph. Um, so yeah, I honestly didn't want to talk too much about it because like it's a little, I've just never seen this concept before. Although it makes sense when you think about it. It's like, oh, let me take, and this set, what they did, like they didn't have like a, uh, a, a target variable. They just took, you know, all, it, it, they treated it as like an unsupervised problem, which I guess is the perfect setting for PCA. Uh, they ran PCA on a bunch of features. They found the component means, and then they take the distance from those component means um, and use that to kind of like look at, okay, um, I guess you could split all those terms, right? Like all these lines in this component one and component two graph represent each observation in, in the train of test sets. If you like looked at this and like said, oh, look, all the test set uh, lines are way farther out or they're, they're pointing out way farther out from the, the means, then that probably means that there's something that the model's just not applicable to the test set. Uh, so yeah, there's a little discussion on it um, that, you know, I think if you're like not working, if you're not working with stuff not impacted by COVID, so just like, I don't know, sports data, right? For the most part, well, even sports data is impacted by COVID, but like, um, it's something that's like not impacted by, by COVID. Uh, I don't know, like the height and weight of people, of human beings, right? If you had something like that, where, you know, that in 2019 is probably gonna look pretty similar to what it is in 2021, uh, you know? This technique is, is, is going to show you that, like, it's going to be very, everything's going to be around zero, zero in this component one, and component two graph. Um, and a lot of the, like this distance uh, histogram, I think, it, I think it would be pretty, like, most, it would look, look at exponential because a lot of distances would be close to zero. Yeah, so I don't want to show anything else. Yeah, like, so they have a function in the applicable package to kind of help with computing this stuff. Um, uh, it's, it works like recipes, I believe, um, where you specify threshold. Uh, I guess this is like an interesting concept, right? We talk about variance explained with PCA. So I guess is what, what this is doing is it'll like find the, increase the number of components until you get reach this threshold of, I want 99% of variance explained. Um, so that's a pretty cool thing that this does that I don't think you'd have to write some code to like do this yourself. So there's a use case for this package in the wild. Um, and then just to show that this works and I also, I kind of found like a bug, I think in the package. Um, I, you can run the score function from the package given your PCA model and I fed it a new observation, one where I put pretty like average values for the SPI features and the importance features. At this time, I'm using everything in the data set. Um, and then I gave it weird values for the probability team one winning, the probability of two, team two winning, so both of them at 10%. And then like really put the probability of a tie or a draw very high, which you, it's just not very common. Like you don't go into a, ma a match expecting a tie unless like, it's like actually advantageous for both teams to tie, which is very rare. Uh, so like, this is a very weird case that I put at the top of this um, data set and asked it to give me all the scores, right? And 
This works like it returns a tibble. Uh, for that first observation, we see a distance of 14.9, which if we go back to this chart, blows the, the highest observation out of, the, out of the water. I think it was near 10 for those. 14.9 is super high. Uh, and this is where I think this is like an error, like a miscalculation or like it's supposed to show 100 percentile, but it shows one here. Because uh, right, like 5.31 is at the 96 percentile. Uh, something closer to zero, right? 0 0.5 is at the, it's under the once percentile, but like 14.9, that should be the hundredth percentile and it's showing one here. I think that's like an issue with the package. Yeah. I agree, um, it looks weird. It's almost like they were sorted independently. <laughs> yeah, I know, like, I guess that's why I was kind of like quickly checking some of these values, right? 5.31 is gonna be close to the 96 percentile, yeah. Look from five up to here. Yeah. That seems right. I was looking at like 1.05, 1 1.57, or 1.05. 1 1.05 would be like great. I guess maybe that is reasonable. Yeah, 1.5 would be pretty close to over here. Yeah, it's like close to like under 10%. I don't know. I think that's, I'm not sure what's up with that. I'm pretty sure I didn't do anything wrong there. <laughs> uh, but and then again, I've been wrong lots of times. But yeah, so I think that was the last thing in the chapter. It actually is a lot to cover, which is why I should not have started two hours ago. But I guess at this point, almost three hours ago. Um, I feel like I did not cover this PCA part as well. Like, I think the general idea here is like, right, like identifying whether it's you're going to be okay using your model you trained for something on like this whole other test set, right? Um, in their case, like I think it was looking at bike traveling or ride share. Uh, so yeah, you can't really use 2018 to forecast 2020. You've heard of like models in production that retrain on new data over time, right? Like I kind of wonder if it, what I was thinking about when reading this was could you have that trigger on something here, like with the PCA? So once you get whatever percent of the new observations that are that are past your percent or th threshold you pick, that's when you, you know, I mean, what if you like either get an alert to retrain it or the model retrains on the new data? Uh, I've never productionized a model like that where it retrains itself, but I was thinking about how this package could help do that. I think what's probably more practical along the same train of thought is like maybe you're training it overnight, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, you're looking at the percent of variance explained by something like this ad or what was the function name? Uh, AD, APD PCA function. You're going to keep running this and look at like the actual, does it tell me I need more or less than what I reported yesterday? Yeah. It's a possible way. Oh, uh, yeah, it's a way of tracking uh, like cool. drift, I guess. So basically you'd use this, like this runs PCA like type analysis on it to kind of keep, like you run this in lieu of like, or alongside running a more expensive model. And this is basically just telling you like how valid the new set is or how likely it is to belong to the same set as the previous one. Is that kind of the idea? Yeah. With the yeah. Package? And that's, yeah, exactly. And, uh, Right, that's why it's like it's unsupervised, right? It's just like it's looking at the, the set itself, right? Like without any objective. Like I just want to see if I can, like how many features I need to like actually explain every observation in this set. Like maybe I can get rid of these five columns because they're redundant, they're linearly dependent on these other columns. The PCA would figure that out for you. I'm like, yeah. I mean, first of all, you could use that for like future engineering. Like, oh, wait, this is like linearly correlated. I don't need this. Um, Oh yeah, it also just tells you like how much, you know, like maybe uh, you work with a data provider, uh, they, they can offer you to provide like three new columns of data. You're like looking at like, okay, is this gonna be useful to my model? Maybe you could run this. I mean, aside from like actually running the model itself, uh, you could say, okay, look, we have these observations. Now we have these new columns for those observations. Do we see like this PCA number increase? Uh, like, are there, is this uh, new data like, creating like theoretically these creating like new information that we can train a model on. 
which could be like super useful. Like say you have a model with like a hundred features and now you're like, okay, what like this data provider is gonna offer us to give us like three to five new columns. And it's like not immediately obvious. I'm like, well, maybe I could try to put that in a model, but like I need to get back to this data provider within like two or three days. And it's like, well, I don't know how, if I have enough time to really optimize a model to incorporate these features. Well, I could throw this PCA process at it and like, look, well, it's at least showing me that like, uh, I do need more PCA components to explain this, the, the variability in the whole uh, data set given these new columns. So it's like, theoretically, it's adding information. Now, whether you actually take use of that or like make that actionable in your model, you know, that's up to you, I guess, when you're modeling, but uh, I could see it being used for something like that. Okay, well, uh, I thought that was gonna be an easier chapter. And the concepts are pretty like straightforward is what I want to say, but at the same time, they actually do like a really good job of like, well, I shouldn't act surprised, but like, obviously they do a good job of uh, explaining like exactly how you would use it um, and like different ways to use the functions in their package. I think you got through a, through a lot for just starting two hours before you basically fit two different models and learn two different packages. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just went, I don't know about y'all, but a lot of times I just go into the r and for their chapter. I, I will end up, I, when I have more time, uh, I do change these, like a lot of the stuff, but like towards the end here, I like literally just copy pasted it and like made sure the common names match with my data set. I did like do some work to like, find extreme examples like mm -hmm. they I guess it like right and their code that they're like they're like slice the one like they already know that the first observation is an extreme example and the yeah. slice six here I'm like okay six observation of my test set is not going to be exactly like this uh, but uh yeah I mean it's great that they have this of course that would have saved me some time but um it was, yeah. cool. it was cool to see applied to a, a different data set though too. Yeah, that was that was the first thing I was stuck on. It's like I just want to do this on a different data set, right? Like I think you guys are the same, right? Or like yeah. just not gonna do the same thing as a chapter. Because sure. you learn something, right? Like my model sucked, so it's, it wasn't like I got the same exact, you know, looking plots as they did. Uh, so you have to figure out, well, is that because my model sucks or like do I really understand the concept? It's also just good to see, like, did they hand pick a data set that works well for this idea, or is this applicable to to a lot of different types of models? And I think that you showed that it is, so that's, that's cool. Yeah, well, for the first plot, they simulated that, but that's, I think yeah. it's one that, like, you justify simulating. It just, you're not going to see a lot of data sets out in the wild, or you can get this pretty clear cutoff between, like, a binary class. Uh, when I saw this example, I was thinking of the fourth down decision models uh, because uh, like Ben Baldwin will say, he's got strong go for it, like, like a strong recommendation to go for it. And and like, if you've got a middling recommendation that the head coach might use their their gut instead. And yeah. so it's kind of like widening the that boundary area, right? Like you only want to give the coach your strongest recommendations and, and maybe widen what they get to decide for themselves or something yeah i think if it really is like a coin flip type situation you know the bot is going to tell you go for it right if it's like 51 percent, yes this is better but like realistically if you're like i don't know an analyst for the team like i think that's one of those you just sit back on i'm like okay i'm not, like not that confident like plus i'm gonna leave this up to the coach it's depending you know it depends on like the momentum of the team I know momentum doesn't exist, but you know, that's all. <laughs> I don't know if it exists or not, but I think we all feel it in some sense. But whereas if it's something like, I don't know, right, it's like a minute and a half left in the game, you just score a touchdown, uh, and you're two touchdowns down, I think for the most part that shows like, okay, going for two, it's a big, I don't know, like, what is it, like six or seven percent boost? And maybe it depends on your team's like 
two point. Sure. All right, but, um, but yeah, I think there's definitely something to it for, especially like those borderline decisions in, in a real world setting, right? Yeah. Um, by the way, like that reminded me of like uh, that fourth down bot where I think it has like three colors where it's like yards on the, the Y axis and like down or like distance to the touchdown on the X axis. And like, there's, I think a couple different shades for like, okay, in this region, you go for it or and then in this region, like you don't go for it. And I think in there, there's like another, I forget like how exactly how that plot is, but uh, it has like some like uncertainty there where it like whites out between the, the bands. Now I'm thinking yeah. like, how did they do that? Like, where do they come up with that uncertainty? Is this like a confidence interval? Is that yeah. a confidence interval? You know. It's a good question. It sounds like a 538 chart. Yeah, it definitely is. And uh, let's see. Yeah, is it this one? Maybe this one's better though. This is cool. Yeah, that's cool. There we go. Oh, yeah. Actual uncertainty. <laughs> yeah, that might be the preview. You might actually find the plot in the article. Uh, I I do see what you're talking about. There's the area that's. <laughs> that's better. I think that's, that's a, is that an uncertainty thing or is that on? Oh, uh, this is oh, slightly EV difference. Well, I guess that that's their measure instead of like wind probability, I guess we're using fixed value. Wait, on the 538 charts, do they use wind probability or? Uh, oh, EP. it's payoff based on expected points. So EP, P, uh, and EV, which I guess is their own metric, their own twist on expected points. Yeah. Anyways, tangent. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>